Welcome to Inside Personal Growth Podcast. Deep dive with us as we unlock the secrets to personal development, empowering you to thrive. Here, growth isn't just a goal, it's a journey. Tune in, transform, and take your life to the next level by listening to just one of our podcasts. Welcome back to another episode of Inside Personal Growth. Um, Jeremy, I do all the time is thank my listeners that come from around the world that listen to my show and have been faithful listeners, the thousands of you out there. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, we're off to a new year here and we have Jeremy Kubichuk on here and Steve Cockrum. Uh, they own a company called Giant and we're going to give you a link to that website as well. As a matter of fact, that company's website is giantworldwide.com. And Jeremy's personal website is jeremykubicek.com. And that is spelled K U B I C E K. And Jeremy is spelled a little different too J E R E M I E. We'll put a link to Amazon to the book itself. Um, but for all you listeners, if you want to check out more about, giant and jeremy in this new wiley book called the communications code i encourage you to go up there and check that out good day to you from oklahoma city how are you doing jeremy i'm doing great good to be with you Greg. thanks for this appreciate the well, time well we appreciate having you uh come on and you and your partner have been running this company for some time and a little bit uh basically in this book, I'm going to actually give my listeners a tad bit about you. It's very, very short, but it works. We were just talking about that. He is the executive chairman and co-founder of Giant G-I, small I, A-N-T, worldwide. He is a global speaker, serial entrepreneur, and Wall Street Journal bestseller, uh, author of Making Your Leadership Come Alive. And the Peace Index, which you see behind his head there, uh, also the author of The 100X Leader, The Five Voices, and The Five Gears. Well, we appreciate your contribution to a very important topic, and I think we could talk for probably hours and hours about kind of the lack of leadership in our country at this point, and the lack of of interest to try and get anything done in our Congress. Um, and I think we hire those constituents to kind of represent us, but lately it doesn't seem like they've been getting much mm -hmm. done. <laughs> so, and I'm sure that my listeners would actually concur with you. So Jeremy, if you would, can you tell the listeners a little bit about Giant, the mission of your organization, mm -hmm. your vision, and why you and Steve wrote the communications code and what you'd really like these listeners to take away from our mm -hmm. interview today. Yeah, so uh, years ago, I used to run some of the largest leadership brands and events, LeaderCast, the Catalyst Conferences, and had uh, bought and owned the John Maxwell Company's uh, assets and a lot of different, uh, worked with a lot of different thought leaders. And I got to this point where we started to see tr uh, adult learning changing that adults were learning differently it used to be butts and seats selling books it used to be a lot of uh, reading a lot of text and all of a sudden but because of technology and the proliferation of content it became a different learning style we started seeing that adults were cynical know-it-alls who didn't read much anymore and they began to to watch a lot more and so we started to adjust around 2013 we started studying going into uh, 21st century learning styles, that it's visual, you have to create common language, and you have to teach it to an educated 13-year-old. Auditory. Uh, Auditory. And, and, yeah, yeah. And so all of a sudden, if you <laughs> teach it very quickly, and, and if you can learn it on a cocktail napkin and teach off of a cocktail napkin, then, then you'll learn. So that's what we did. We started to play with this, and it started to grow and scale. And then we found ourselves at this point of like, you know what, how do we license this? How do we open source it? So we're in about 120 countries. We have about uh, close to a thousand, right at a thousand consultants and coaches who train off of our content and use it to scale. But our purpose is really, how do we build more relationally intelligent leaders? Because most of the drama comes from a relational unintelligent leaders and it just creates sideways energy, right? And so we figured out 
tools and things that work around personality, emotional intelligence, hard skills, so that it helps them become more effective in the way they communicate and build trust with others. Yeah, and you do an exceptional job of it. I've been to your website. I've seen the apps. I've seen what you guys have created. I've seen you've built a huge coaching community underneath you, um, which is exceptional. Um, many leadership firms go at this. They don't go at it that way. Um, I've had many people on here speaking with books about leadership that have built some pretty big companies, one probably as big as yours. And, you know, I think it comes down to, and you're talking about in this book, not only healthy communications, you say, is an exception and not the norm, but how can listeners become what you call people whispers as you speak about mm -hmm. in the book, because, you know, a leader is about grit, determination, uh, communications, um, collaboration. You know, we could name all the acronyms that describe leaders. Unfortunately, we seem to get some leaders that have more of some and less of others, and they're not particularly good communicators. Right. So how do you get them or help them to become much better communicators? It starts with a mirror. <laughs> uh, you know, mirrors, uh, mirrors don't judge. Uh, mirrors reflect reality. And mm. the idea that we try to start with was what's it like to be on the other side of you? So know yourself to lead yourself. Once you know yourself and can lead yourself, then you can become a people whisperer because people see that you're leading yourself. But if you're not, that's the problem with the word hypocrisy. Most people experience hypocrisy from leaders because they tell you to do something they're not willing to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. So you have to establish the simple self-awareness, the basic know yourself, lead yourself. Then when people see that you're changing and you're you're getting the broccoli out of your own teeth because you see it in the mirror, mm -hmm. then they, they might be willing to listen to you when you show them the mirror that they have broccoli in their teeth. And so this journey then being a people whisperer is actually using mirrors strategically to help get broccoli out of your teeth without judgment. Because when judgment enters in, pride comes in and self-preservation uh, pre and walls come up. And that's typically what keeps people from being a people whisperer. Yeah, you know, obviously we've heard Brene Brown saying being authentic, being transparent, um, it's a big issue. And we know some of the biggest issues is you can't have a good leader unless there's ego. But a lot of times that ego gets in the way um, because people choose to um, talk at you and then instead of listen to you. Um, what do you would you say about the good listening skills um, with empathetic listening skills with somebody who's going to be a good communicator? So for us, we've, we say communication is really about managing expectations. So let's say, Greg, we're having a dinner, okay? We have a conversation. You share some things with me. When you share and you're communicating, you're transferring information. That information has an expectation attached to it. You're expecting something from me. You're expecting me to just listen. You're expecting me to celebrate. You're expecting me to maybe collaborate with you. But mm -hmm. if if I don't know what the expectation is, or let's just say I'm not very relationally intelligent and you just want me to listen. And then I come with full critique. Well, why'd you do that? That's the dumbest thing you could do. You ought to, you should have done X, Y, and Z. Then that's probably the last time you're ever going to share information with me. And so I'm going to be very defensive from then that's on. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so what happens then is really great leaders are great communicators and great communicators are great at understanding expectations. When Don't you believe there has to be an element in, in this, Jeremy, of a level of grace? You know, when I say this, I mean that really importantly, I've seen so many leaders I don't even think sometimes they think before they speak. <laughs> you know, they they get so emotional about something, they blurt something out, they hurt some people's feelings, just like you just said. Um, and that scar with those people 
stays there a long time. A long time. In fact, in the book, we talk about the first two chapters. Uh, do you understand what it's been like to be on the other side of you? Because you might have good intent to want to communicate, but you have power plays. So what happens then is maybe it's your ego, maybe it's your personality, maybe it's your positional power, maybe it's your age, whatever you, that you'll project on other people. So then they experience your challenge, but they don't experience your support. And then when they don't experience your support first, they're going to put walls up to protect themselves. So yeah. what you have to do is you have to be consistent in bringing support, which is grace and challenge, which is truth. Grace and truth live together. It, it, great leaders manage and calibrate grace and truth or support and challenge. And what we're trying to do is give people the tools to know actually how do I actually support people? How do I do that? Oh my gosh, I do do that, don't I? Yeah, I kind of dominate people. I don't mean to, but I do. What do I do about that? And that's ultimately what our writings are about. Well, you know, you mentioned in the book about the relationship and how to establish or re-establish a relational trust between two people. If you could, can you speak about the past writings? Because we talked about it a bit. I introduced mm -hmm. the other two books regarding the five voices and the five gears. Because mm -hmm. fundamentally, when people start out writing, they start and there's almost like a stair step I've noticed, you know, I'll do my first book, I'll do my second book, I'll do my third book, I'll do my fourth book. And with inside these books, you can usually find, especially if they're business books, a, a trail, right, mm -hmm. of the growth of the person writing the book or co-authors writing the book, while at the same time saying, hey, we found something exceptionally new mm -hmm. and we want to expose it. So our in, in that regard, our manifesto book was the 100x leader. We put it all together there. The five voices is basically the foundational of knowing yourself, uh, a personality. What we did is we took uh, Carl Jung's work and we simplified it, whereas a lot of people don't, um, you know, they get lost in language. Of like, I don't know what an ISTJ is, or I don't know what a seven with a wing eight is, or it's too complicated to, to scale. So we're like, how do we make it simple enough so that everyone can play? And that's what we did the five voices. So we took personality and goes, there's five main personalities uh, with many other iterations around it, 16 total combinations, but there's the nurturer and a creative and a guardian and a connector and a pioneer. And each of them have louder voices. The loudest voices are the pioneers and the connectors. And as leaders, they take all the oxygen out of the room because they're the most future oriented. They're the loudest because they're trying to direct people. But oftentimes they'll minimize the other voices and therefore they don't create the value and they get compliance, not engagement because they're talking all the time. So th that's an example of how we've uh, broken down personality and made it uh, come alive inside organizations, families, and so forth. So you made it years, like almost but... like you made it almost like five archetypes. That's right. Uh, these that's are right. these are the five archetypes, and that's good. I mean, five is a good number. It's easy yeah, to remember. Yeah. I know people that come out with archetypes. They come out with so many. It's hard to remember. Like you said, you wanted to make it simple. But what are the five gears? So the five gears now become uh, it actually most of our uh, content comes with issues that Steve and I have had uh, with each other. I mean, conflict. So what we do is we dissect the conflict and then we figure out, well, man, I bet everyone deals with this, right? So uh, my situation was I was, uh, for a number of years when I was running all these businesses in Atlanta, I was overproductive and underpresent with people. So I was consumed with productivity, but I was underpresent with my wife, my kids, my coworkers, my employees. And so I was like, man, can I be present and productive and still get a lot done? And so then when uh, we moved to London, uh, Steve, I was noticing, observing my business partner, and I was trying to explain what I was seeing, what it was like to be on the other side of him. And so I used the metaphor of a manual stick shift and the, the manual stick shift, you know, the most are manual in the UK and the US most are automatic and they shift for you. 
And I was trying to explain to him emotional intelligence. So I put it in five simple gears. Fifth gear is focus mode. Fourth gear is multitask. Third gear is social. Second gear is connect mode. First gear is recharge. We need every gear every day. So the emotional awareness, emotionally aware or relationally intelligent person is automatic. They can shift in and out of each gear all day long. Well, the interesting part is, is if you have your gear order, your spouse, a partner, uh, coworkers, they have their gear orders. What gear should you be in right now? Some people are in fifth mode far too long. They like to focus. They close the door. No one's around them. They eat lunch at their computer and they are having relational issues. Some people it's, Hey, we're going to the pub. It's after work and we're in third gear. We're just chit chatting, small talk, social. And you come walking in with a fourth gear question and asking about an email from Mark. Well, we're going to turn our shoulder to you. So instead of turning our shoulder to you, we just call plays. We go, hey, we're in third. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad. I'm in the wrong gear. So it's a sign language. So, so you've, what, created, everything- you've created kind of a sign language for that. And I think that leads me to this, this next question. I think those gears are a great analogy, right? Um, the key is getting the people you're working with in the same gear, <laughs> right? So you speak about, if you could speak to the listeners about breaking the communication codes, as well as the four stages and how to better decipher people's expectations, because I think that's where you come in when you're in fourth gear or fifth, and they're in third gear, and you're not deciphering kind of where they're at, right? You're literally asking a question about an email, as you mentioned, and they're just doing chit chat that's it and and it's all expectation management if you think about it right hey, i'm expecting us to be in third gear small talk and you're talking to me about an email but this is third gear time do you see that so what we're doing is we're creating a common objective language so that the subjective drama doesn't enter in Mm -hmm. So by me, instead of me nagging you or a spouse going, Hey, you're always on your phone. You're always on your phone. You're always on the phone. All you have to do is go, Hey, I thought we were doing two time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. I'm so now I can adjust. So now I'm adjusting expectations. So the same with communication. So let me give you uh, the five C's. I'll just tell you what they are. So we figured out that there's five actual code words. So every communication has an expectation. Every expectation has a code word attached to it. If you solve the code word, you can solve their expectation. Mm -hmm. So we we figured out that most people, they want either celebration, care, they want um, clarity, collaboration, collaboration, or critique. Right. Now, very few people really want critique. A lot of people like to give critique. What about clarification? Yeah, clarification is three. Yeah. Yeah. So I hear it as care, Celebration, collaboration, critique, and clarification. So these are your five C's, right? Those are the five C's. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it makes sense because our listeners, this is like the toolbox. Because in essence, at the core of this book, Communication Codes, is understanding these five C's and understanding where people are. Mm -hmm. Right? That's it. Would that be correct? That's right. And, and and then giving them the, the language or asking you, okay, hey, so Greg, we're, we're at dinner tonight. What You're sharing this information. What do you want from me tonight? You want me to celebrate? You want to care? Do you need you know clarity? Do you want to collaborate? What is it you want? And if you know the language, then it becomes very easy. And you go, hey, I just need, I, I, want, I want you to clarify first, but then I, I value your, what you bring. I want to collaborate. But make sure, let's make sure that we're good on knowing what we're talking about first. So do you utilize things like clarifying questions? You know, I have a master's degree in psychology. So Mm -hmm. when you go through counseling, Mm -hmm. um, you ask clarifying questions. Like Mm -hmm. I would say, hey, Jeremy, this is what I heard you say, right? And I think um, your code system is cool, but only if you're in the same realm of people using the code because 
Otherwise, actually, no one else is going to know what the hell. No, the actually, if is. if you get it, you can actually ask it without them knowing to. So I've gotten okay. we've gotten really good. So an example is, um, uh, it, it's um, hey, I hear what you're saying. I'm still clarifying. What would be most helpful tonight? As I'm mm -hmm. as I'm listening to you, what would be most helpful? Well, I just need to talk, and so I know that means care. I use clarity to figure out care. Or I'm now aware um, they are in celebration mode, and I can then say, "Man, that sounds like it sounds like you need a big high five. Is that where you know?" And I'm I'm basically aligning with their expectations. But what it's doing is it's the platinum rule: do unto others as they would want done to themselves. I'm now what I'm doing is I'm shifting my normal tendencies to start thinking about the other person. Where are mm -hmm. they at? What are they wanting right now? seems like this i'm now clarifying if i give them the language even if they don't know what it means i can still say sounds like you want to celebrate is that is that our plan for tonight then i'm at least aligning myself uh, as well, much you, as possible you're at least asking the clarifying question right, That's right. Yeah. i would assume they know what they want but that brings me to this you know you mentioned that some might dismiss this care um of one of the five C's uh, and want to skip forward to other sections. And mm -hmm. then you speak about what people need, which is emotional support, security, affirmation, and bonding. Mm -hmm. Talk with us about that because I think, look, if I'm here and you're here and I don't get clarity on the fact that we're supposed to both be together because I've got another agenda, right? I'm, I'm trying to do something else and I can't get you to switch gears. You said five gears. Um, how do we actually help each other align toward our common bonding so that it's much better communication? Well, so I would break it down into uh, population density. 40% of the population roughly um, are thinkers. Uh, yeah, sixty percent are more feelers. So if you think about that in our society, so thinkers, how they want care versus how feelers want care. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking feelers, when people hear the word care, that means you want me to give you a hug, a high five, a uh, listen. What is that? And a thinker goes, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. I don't know what you need. I don't know <laughs> why you would need that. So it's really difficult. On the right. other side, thinkers need care as well, but their care is completely different than feeler care. Thinker care is basically, I need a safe place to get the poison out. I need to talk out loud and just vent and you're safe. And that's showing me care when you let me do that. Great. Yeah. Uh, so understanding the differences of what care really means, but what you're doing is at the core of it, when people feel critiqued, if they feel challenged with not support, then they're going to feel critical. Not the real word of critique is really meant to help. Right. Critical is a negative view of someone. Right. So right. you don't want to criticize. Times, but if I don't know that you're for me, if I think that you're for yourself or you're against me, then any feedback that you bring me, I'm going to see it through the lens of criticalness or negativity not through a positive that you're fighting for my highest possible good. And that's ultimately the relational intelligence we're trying to help executives, leaders get. Like there's a whole nother, we're in a whole new era of relational dynamics that certain right. personalities are just not used to. It's not the old school Ford days of you just come in and punch the clock and do your work. People are so fickle, they'll leave over a conversation. I mean, I work inside the sports world as well. So I coach a number of, of uh, football coaches and I've worked with a number of football teams and, and I've been working inside specifically the University of Oklahoma football team and watching the transfer portal of these kids just changing and deciding to leave a school over a conversation. Uh, yeah. It's unreal. It's, it's So that's the era we're in, right? And so you've, yeah. you've got to have relationally intelligent coaches and or leaders because the the old days are, are just gone yeah i i think that coaching from the old days definitely is gone and um i know that um 
some of the people that I've worked with, like David Meltzer and people like that, you probably know is like a, has a sports signing kind of business where he, he used to sign all kinds of athletes. Now, one of these things, as you mentioned, we talked about care, but clarifying is valuable because we just said it enables us to communicate more effectively with others, clarifying. But to resolve misunderstandings, like you said, with these kids who just like are taking off and prevent confusion. And I think that preventing confusion is really the biggest area because they're not clarifying, right? And they're not getting the other person's input. I often think that sometimes they miss the important question, which is, what do you think about this? Now, that's my own personal take on this. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't feel included. They don't feel part of it. If it's a decision being made, hey, it's my decision. This is what I made. You do it or the highway kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Not anything where they could uh, actually include somebody. What are some of the ways to better clarify and actively listen to the other person so that they don't walk out the door like you just said? Mm -hmm. So we've taken this even further and we've figured out there's a custom communication code. So there's a general communication code. These are the five C's, right? But if I, let's say you and I, we're buds and we're hanging out and we're, or we're even close. We're business partners, Greg. So now all of a sudden I'm going to come to you and I'm going to go, Hey, specifically, here's what I'm really looking for. Uh, I want you to number one, clarify, but when you clarify, would you please just ask and go as deep as you want until I know that you've gotten what I'm trying to say. And then I want your collaboration, but don't collaborate before you clarify. So, mm -hmm. but I'm giving you the, the insights. Like I want you to ask questions. I want you to dig. I want you to go as deep as you possibly can. I have to do this with my wife. We'll sit in the hot tub and we'll have conversations. And what I figured out was I have a tendency to want to celebrate with her and I have a tendency to want to clarify with her. Uh, she doesn't need a lot of care. She knows that I care. Um, she doesn't want critique, right? And so then what does she want for, what does she tend to do to me? Well, I, I'm desiring clarity and then um, some celebration, but I normally get collaboration and critique. So we have, we, we, we're missing each other. And so now by using the language, we have now actually gotten on the same page of expectation because I'm specifically saying, this is exactly how I want the, to, to, to play the communication. So then she can match my expectations. And conversely, now I know what she is exactly wanting. So I think that's the beauty of this is like, once you figure out the common generic language, you can customize it and, and using clarity to really, really make sure that you're connecting with the other person. And that's what unlocks relationships. It's, it's a consistency of communication and relational trust means that walls will fall down because I know you're fighting for me. You're not just, you're not just doing what you normally do. Yeah. And I think that active listening part is really important because they need to feel like they're heard, not only feel like they're heard, but understood. And it does take a certain training to realize that active listening uh, with empathy and understanding to know the other person's side of it, especially if there's a disagreement um, before you start to try and resolve that. And you told a great story in the book about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Um, and it's really about them finding this way to collaborate. I mean, Steve Jobs, always in all the books written about him and what people used to say, because I've had plenty of people on here that wrote books about him and so on, used to get, I think, kind of a bum rap. Um, granted, he was not probably the best communicator, <laughs> okay? Uh, and he could be very curt uh, and very quick at what he did. But you'll find a lot of leaders are like that. So if you're trying to help leaders be better, how do you help them collaborate? Yeah. So um, again, it goes back to, um, I had this situation happen this morning, actually, with a very strong leader that I have been working with on a project. And I had to remind him of certain ways because he was losing his 
team because of just some basic things he was doing when he didn't need to do those things, right? So mirrors, do you know what it's like to be on the other side of you? Uh, what are you trying to say? And what are you afraid of losing? And in a lot of cases, I think back to Steve Jobs, I think Steve was so brilliant and he had so much in his head, but he had a hard time getting all of these big ideas through this small mouth. And he would always also not uh, throw his, cast his pearls before swine. So <laughs> therefore he had to trust the competency on the, of the people on the other side of him. Once he would do that, then there was some walls that would come down and they were able to do some, some great things. I think that's what Steve and Steve Wozniak did for a period of time. Over time, obviously, they didn't stay business partners and there's you know all types of things. But I do think it's the, the idea that if, you, if you're a strong personality, if you can simply be aware of who are you on the other side of, how are they wired? If you can get good at that, that take, we've tried to... We tried to create books to make it and concepts to make it simple enough so you can figure out the basics without having to go get an MBA for it. So you right. can actually get get close. Well, then if you just use tools, okay, the five C's, what do they want from me? If the other person knows the language, what do you want? <laughs> I need care. Okay, what does care look like? I just need you to listen. Okay, I'm not very good at it, but I'll try. If you can actually have open dialogue like that, that's when authenticity comes in because the other person knows you're trying, even if you're not good at it. And that's where they get to see your full intent. Uh, it's most people who are so busy and they're so overproductive and underpresent that they minimize their influence. And mm -hmm. long term, that minimization of influence causes all types of drama and they ultimately lose. They lose families, they lose teams. They don't get to the vision because they've undermined their vision by their own style. Well, you know, you take Steve Jobs, you take Elon Musk, their communication styles are pretty similar mm -hmm. um, in that they were both thinkers, like you said earlier, and they were both brilliant guys. Okay. Let's face it. Um, created huge brilliance. They're degree of intelligence if you took an intelligence as a matter of fact somebody wrote something the other day or i think it was elon himself he said you wouldn't want to be in my head mm -hmm. you wouldn't want my mind um mm -hmm. because it's always on it's always moving he can hardly ever turn it off and he said it's not a great thing um mm -hmm. and i and i think that's true for a lot of good thinkers who've mm -hmm. been super creative have changed the world like steve and him uh and it's a challenge, and it's totally a challenge you can see about how they handle the press, about how they communicate to the world, about how the world sees them. You know, they might be a brilliant mind, but they'll even tell you, um, and, and they maybe don't want to admit this, but they're not the best people. They're not people people. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a challenge. It's a whole other yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole other thing. But now, you know, you mentioned that critiquing is a valuable tool for helping individuals and groups improve. And we've talked about it, their skills and abilities. And again, critiquing those two guys would be a challenge for anybody. And it fosters creative and intelligent growth. How would we use this constructive method to become better at critiquing? Because like you just said, we don't want to feel like somebody's nitpicking at us. <laughs> Yeah, so back to thinker feelers. So let's say this is my idea. Uh, what feelers will do, or thinkers will do, is say, hey, Greg, here's my idea. What do you think of it? Shoot holes in it. Great. Okay, they take it. Now, what do you think? I worked on it. What do you think? Oh, good. Thanks, man. You made it better. What happens, though, is feelers take the same idea. Well, what do you think of my idea? And they put it right here over their heart. And then you shoot at it. And then all of a sudden, there's blood. And people are like, why did you put it over your heart? This isn't personal. This is business. And you're like, no, everything is personal, right? To 60% of the population. So we have to just be aware of critique and almost asking permission two or three times. Like, okay, you really want my critique? And uh, if, if you do, then just realize, you know, I sometimes can do just, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use a machine gun here. Are we good? Do you have, do you have your Kevlar on? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and that's, because you need to be aware, are they a feeler or, they, or a thinker? 
if they're a feeler, clarify before you bring it. Totally. And that's just some, some, but these are just some basic things that can be done, but the attempt will be appreciated by the other person if they see it versus if they do what you normally do. Well, why'd you do it that way? That's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Uh, nobody does it that way. No, let me have it. You don't need to do it here, right? No one wants to feel like they're an idiot. So that's in essence what happens. So it's, what does it feel like to be on the other side of you? What do people see on the other side of you? And can you adjust? It's a, that's really great advice. And I think people have to know what personality or archetype is the people they're dealing with. And once they know that they can reframe how they're going to approach it so as to uh, improve the communications without hurting feelings. Uh, and I think that's so imperative. Now, in kind of wrapping up our interview, your last chapter of your book, you you talk about creating a plan, right? Uh, communications plan. What three things can the listeners take away from our conversation that you'd like them to take away today to be better communication, more effective communicators, and I'm going to say with more compassion and understanding? Mm-hmm. Well, so you have to first decide, is that relationship worth it or not? Because in some cases, you're like, I don't know if I want to work on that relationship. I mean, it's too far gone. And that's just a reality. But let's say that it is. Let's say you do want to work on it. The first thing is, okay, what's it been like to be on the other side of you? Do you need to apologize for something? Do you need to actually say, hey, Greg, I know um, in the past, I've probably been a little dominating. And man, I got to tell you, it's not what I want. I'm going to go to work on it, but I know it's going to take time for you to believe that this is real. So mm-hmm. just letting you know, I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm going to work on it. That's number one. Two, I'm going to ask, what is what is the communication that you would most like with that other person? Hey, these are the communication code. Help me communicate more effectively with you. What is it you typically want from me? Man, I just need you to care, and I want you to celebrate. But what if I don't think it's worth celebrating? <laughs> you know, so we talk openly about it. If you have a relationship and and they go, I just need you to care. Okay, what does that look like? Now, once they tell you, practice. Uh, close the lip. Do you have discernment on when you want to critique? And if they ask you that you want to do care in celebration, stay in that for a while. Then build up trust. And then maybe in the future, when there is a critique moment, you can ask them if you can collaborate or critique, but that's the that's a, a a process. That's just one example of what you can do. You have to decide if, it, if it's worth it. You have to deal with your past. You need to know and understand the communication code together, and then you practice using it and getting custom with it. Um, just maybe you'll unlock that relationship. Well, the great thing is that for anybody wanting to look at the communication code and the five C's. Uh, this is an easy read book. It's not super thick. Uh, you guys can By design. This, yeah, you guys can pick this up at Amazon. The other thing I'm going to encourage anybody out there who's in middle management, upper management, CEO of a company and saying, hey, this was a great conversation this morning. I want to learn more. Go to the the website for the company, which is Giant Worldwide giant worldwide there you can connect you can also uh, see that they've got lots of coaches that they can get out to your company Um, you can also go to jeremy's website that's j-e-r-e-m-i-e-k-k-u-b-i-c-e-k there you can learn about his speaking more about him if you want to have him come talk at your company uh, you certainly want to go there Uh, Jeremy, it's been a pleasure having you on Inside Personal Growth, uh, spending time talking about your new book, plus for all of those who are interested in the five gears or the five voices or the peace index or the hundred X, we'll put links to those at Amazon as well, because those are prior books. Sounds like the hundred X actually pulls it all together in one book. Uh, But this is the book we talked about today. Um, Jeremy, any parting words for the listeners? No, just uh, excited for you to, you know, work on your relationships and go for it. And I would just encourage you, it can be done. 
it does take work. Um, but if you really want to unlock the relationship and then, then use the communication code, it's very helpful. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for being on Insight Personal Growth. Thanks, Greg.